we started it. Okay. Good evening, everyone. We'll be starting the meeting. Okay. Right. Councillors, we're going to be starting the meeting. It's live broadcasting. Thank you so much. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Councillor Dogan. I am the chair of the audit committee. Please note that this meeting is recorded by the council for live and subsequent broadcasts via the council's internet site. Officers will introduce themselves when speaking. Uh, can I kindly ask members to just go around and introduce themselves? So, I'm the chair, Councillor Dogan. Councillor Isidore Stiakidis, uh, Central Tottenham Ward. Councillor Cathy Brennan, Councillor for Muswell Hill and Vice Chair. Councillor Mary Mason, Councillor for Bounds Green. Councillor Alessandra Rossetti, Councillor for Alexandra Park. Apologies have been received from uh, Rina Deba, our independent member. She has joined us online. Hi there. Good evening, Rini Deba, independent member, joining online as I'm currently abroad. Thank you. Uh, any item three, any urgent business? None reported, Chair. Item four, declaration of interest. Anybody else interested to declare? No. Nope. Item five, deputation petitions. There's no none, Chair. Thank you. So the minutes from the last meeting, um, I had a look at them, so if any other members had a chance to look at them or any amendments, any changes that you think. If not, we'll agree the minutes from the last meeting. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, agreed. agreed. Thanks so much. So we'll move on to the next item, which is item seven, Treasury Management Update on tre Treasury Management Update and out turn 23-24. Can I now invite officer? Sorry. Sorry, it's not technically about the minutes, but it's about the list of actions and have a comment. Uh, so I was waiting. If, uh, okay, well, what's, what's the comment? If you can speak closer. There are a couple of actions which have been marked as completed, uh, and uh, I refer the second one on page 11, and it's about uh, uh, the presentation from the head of procurement. Um, the head of procurement is scheduled to attend the audit committee with an update in October 2024. So I was wondering if we should put this action as completed in October rather than now. And similarly for the action on page 44, sorry, 14, uh, 18 January 2024 about Pendaren House. Uh, uh, there's going to be a follow up of the audit. Uh, uh, in this financial year with a follow-up, uh, and I was wondering if the action should be marked as completed when the follow-up is done. Okay, so we just note those, note those down and we'll, we'll, we'll amend them accordingly. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Rossetti, for those comments. Um, we, will, we will amend them accordingly. Right, so item number seven, Treasury Management Update. So can I now Introduce, can I now invite officers to introduce the report? Lead uh, Officer Tim. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Tim Mpofu. I'm the Head of Pensions and Treasury here at Haringey, and I'll be introducing the Treasury Management Outturn Report for the year 2023-2024. Uh, um, this report provides an update to members on the Treasury management activities of the Council um, over the past year. So that's covering the full period from the 1st of April 2023 um, all the way through to the 31st of March 2024. Um, so members will be familiar with some of the updates I was uh, presenting to this committee over the last few years, over the last 12 months. Um, essentially, this year was just characterized by high levels of inflation. Um, and in response to that, the global central banks increasing um, the, the interest rates in order to try and combat that inflation. Um, so at the start of the year, inflation was around 8.7%. It proved stickier than expected, um, ending the year around 3.2%. In response, the Bank of England increased its rate for 4.25%. 
um, all the way up to 5.25% and you remained at that level and you're still at that level um, for the remainder of the year. So this had um, a few implications. The, the first one is obviously the cost of borrowing increased over the time period. Um, interestingly, as you see on the chart, I think it's on section 6.2, is the cost of borrowing over the course of the year fluctuated, and there is quite a bit of uh, volatility that we do experience uh, when rates are at this level. Um, so at the start of the year, um, it was more beneficial for us to borrow long term. Um, but as we went throughout the year, you can see that the lower end of the curve also started to come down and it became more attractive to borrow on a shorter basis. Um, so this just highlights the importance when we're approaching treasury management of having a balanced portfolio of both long term and short term borrowing, um, which is the uh, the practice that we've taken out throughout the course of the year. And where possible, we've taken advantage of opportunities given where volatility has been. Um, in terms of what the outlook looks like now, I know there's no outlook in this paper, um, but there still remains a great deal of uncertainty in terms of the future of interest rates. Um, inflation was reported yesterday again at 2%. Um, it proved um, to be higher than expectations, and the pricing yesterday was around 50% 50, 50 um, on whether rates would come down or whether they'll stay at the same level. Um, so again, this has a number of implications. The first one is actually on the cost of borrowing. It probably doesn't have much of an impact. Um, for that, it's probably more the fiscal position of the UK, where the market will pay a lot more attention. Um, so we do expect, perhaps in the autumn budget, that there'll be a bit more move, and certainly the Bank of England may not wish uh, to move in, ad in ahead of that. When it comes to income, though, there's going to be a bit of an impact if rates were to come down. Um, the rates we get from the Debt Management Office are really linked to the um, to that cost of um to the bank rate, and if the rate came down, then we'd expect that the income we're expecting this year would also come down. So that's another thing which I think would just be a key theme um, of the new financial year in terms of the reports going forward. So a bit more on the local context in terms of the decisions we made. Um, over the year, uh, overall borrowing increased by 36 million, ending at around 820 million. Um, a large part of this borrowing was really refinancing existing loans. Um, so there is more than 36 million that we took out in actual loans, uh, but part of it was just to refinance loans that are already in the portfolio. In terms of treasury balances, it increased again, or it decreased uh, by 60 million, starting the year at 94 million, and then ending around 34. Primarily, we did have a lot of grants that came in at the beginning of the year. I think members will remember talking around our decision to delay borrowing because we did have a lot of cash. As the year went through, um, cash balances did start to decrease, and as such, we increased our borrowing activities. So um, 30 million is broadly where we're expecting to be on average this year as well, um, although there do tend to be these fluctuations where you might get government funding that's not been expected. Um, so the other final things just to highlight, um, in terms of um, there's a table in, in, in the appendix on the cost of borrowing, in terms of the, the borrowing cost and the treasury income, both were within budget. Um, and also in terms of the key performance indicators, those were all still um, in, in line um, we, we, with the targets that were set uh, when we set this treasury strategy for 23-24. So those were all my opening remarks. I'm happy to um, open up for question, Chair, if that's all right. Yeah, thanks. First of all, I know the lobos going down and is there a hint there that we are likely within the next year to get a, a few more as well down that is a long-standing issue uh, you can say something i think the <clears throat> yeah okay yes. sorry, sorry that, yeah. or just a small thing 5.6 in the page 26 the the, these rates there, the credit score, credit rating, etc., sound a bit worrying. I don't know whether the amounts presumably are very small, but is there something to be worried, something to be noticed, to, to, to look at? And uh, finally, the PFI, I, I don't understand how the, the, if you give me some explanation, how it has gone up, if you like, our <laughs> borrowing requirement on that one. Thank you, Councillor Dyke. Okay, there's quite a range of questions there. Um, so I'll start with the with the Lobos, if that's all right. Um, so over the last year, we refinanced one of the Lobos, which was worth about 25 million, which is outlined on section 4.14. Um, essentially, in this case, the Lobo lender did exercise their option. We were expecting this, so we did have discussions with our Treasury advisors in the lead up to that. 
Um, and as a result, we were actually able to refinance that specific loan at a lower rate than it was already at. Um, but that was, again, a function of us working quite closely uh, with the Treasury advisor and also fortunate timing. In terms of going forward, um, there are about uh, 50 million of the Lobos will be due um, at some point this year. We are still communicating with our Treasury advisor. It's unlikely that any of those lenders would want to exercise the borrowing, uh, the, the, the options, just based on what kind of is the underlying strategies they've got to support those. So we consider those to be relatively low risk. But again, if markets were to move differently, um, there could be um, an opportunity to do so. Um, however, the big portion of it, the other 50 million, is uh, in four years' time. So there is no risk of, for refinancing. Uh, but it's something that we're continuing to look and review um, going forward. In terms of Section 5.6, um, I didn't quite understand what the worry is. Um, essentially, this is the Treasury investments that we're receiving. Um, so over the year, the income we're actually able to generate the, is, has increased. So that's a positive for us. So again, to my earlier remarks around the Bank of England being closely tied, um, the bank rate at the moment is 5.25. The rate that we're able to get from the debt management office for overnight deposits is 5.19%. If that was to change, you'd expect that 5.19% to change um, in accordance with that change as well. Um, so that is, in effect, um, a, a It might be me having difficulty in reading the table, but uh, if the credit, the, the credit score and the credit rating are lower, you know, than the average for their similar authorities. does make me worry a bit. That's what I wanted an explanation. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I misunderstood that. So you're referring to the credit rating. Um, so in terms of the credit rating, um, a lower score is better. Um, so you want to be towards one. If you're one, you're investing in investment grade, which is the safest um, um, range of sort of fixed income you can be invested in. Um, so essentially what this table is saying is that our risk, and this, this is a consistent of our strategy, our risk is actually lower than other local authorities, mainly because we only invest for the debt management office. Outside. Okay, <laughs> that, 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 that's fine. So. Uh, so on, on finance, uh, on, on PFI, um, which I think you referenced, um, so the key reason for that, so that number for PFI includes finance leases as well. So PFI has actually decreased, um, I think, by 5 million during the year, but the leases have increased because of renewals throughout the course of the year. I have a couple of questions. So the first one is on section 4.7. And uh, it's mentioned um, HRA uh, PWLB rate, which is available to qualifying authorities and has a discount rate of 0.40%. Uh, so I was wondering if we do qualify and if there has been uh, any any plan to, to replace the uh, HRA loans. And the second question is on section 4... Uh, Hold on, 6.2. And uh, it says that because of an average rate of return of 4.93%, uh, uh, now we have an investment portfolio balance of 81 million pounds. And I was wondering if you could say what would be the implication of this? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Rosetti. So on your first question with regards to the HRA rate, um, yes, we do qualify. Um, and in fact, that rate has been in place since last year. So a lot of the borrowing we did take was more for the HRA than it is for the council. Um, it's been a great opportunity for the council to be able to replace some of that older borrowing. Um, and even to the point around the Lobos, um, a lot of the refinancing for the Lobos was done using the HRA rate, hence we're able to get a better rate that way. Um, in terms of the other section, I think it was a 6.2 you referenced. Uh, just want to see if I can get to that. Yes, 6.2. Um, which essentially is talking around um, our budget performance. Um, so essentially, I think what we're trying to say in that paragraph is at the beginning of the year, we made some assumptions of what we thought our average balances would be, uh, but also what we'd be able to earn in interest rates. Um, we underestimated both things, and as a result, we were able to get more treasury income than we'd expected at the beginning of the year, which is shown in the table. Um, so essentially, the average rate was higher at 4.93 than the 2.5 we expected, but also because of those grants I mentioned at the beginning, we actually had higher cash balances than we, we expected. We thought we'd have 20 million. We actually, on average, had about 80 million. Um, so that was just, I think, a one-off for that year uh, based on the specific factors to that year. I would imagine this year, the situation might not necessarily be the same. Um, and yeah, we'll probably be playing quite closely to what the budget we've assumed. But so would this be money available for capital uh, uh, expenditure? Would this 
money available for capital expenditure or, or not since yes yeah, so the the money is just part of the revenue budget for the council um okay. so it does help with the um with any overspend it offsets it to some degree okay yeah. thank you thank you um so looking at your report there's obviously been a very tricky year uh, which you've reported back to us throughout that time so thank you for that and i think that we followed with interest the we now have a different government um, and we also know that there are expectations by local authorities, which the government's trying to quite calm, but there are expectations that, that things will get better. Um, will that how is that impacting this year, or isn't it, on your Treasury reports? Um, so from a Treasury specific area, and I'm sure Tyron can kind of speak more in terms of the wider council picture. From Treasury perspective, the key things we'd look out for is the impact any of the government's decisions would have on the cost of borrowing. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be the biggest um, aspect for us in terms from a risk management perspective. Um, and I think to my earlier comments, that would be literally driven by what the fiscal position is going to be, what they're going to announce as sort of some of the policies um, they're going to put in place in order to try and boost growth, because I think that is the ambition for the government. Um, so from a treasury perspective, it's essentially going to be the market impact rather than any other factor. Um, but I'm sure those announcements on councils will have different uh, uh, impacts on other parts of the um, the council. And presume, sorry, presumably you'll be reporting that back to us as we go along because it's possible that we'll be um, in a much healthier financial position. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chair. If I could just come in just generally. So, hi, everybody. I'm Tara Nees, Director of Finance. Um, so, just looking at the wider financial position, so the Treasury Management Report and performance that Tim's presented today is absolutely a part of our financial position, but it is much wider than that. So I think, you know, whether you've heard it in this committee or other committees, you will have heard that we're in, along with other local authorities, a really challenging position financially. I think it's a little bit early to say in terms of any impact in terms of the new government. So we will absolutely be keeping an eye on any announcements around new funding, et cetera, new requirements, et cetera. But I do think it's too early to say but absolutely we are we are keeping our ears close to the ground and also making sure that we're part of so any conversations that we need to be having with government going forward however and we might come on to it as part of the next agenda item but just very broadly we are very very uh proactively looking at um uh and uh, uh kpmg colleague to the minor mentioned it earlier very much looking at uh, a medium-term financial strategy over the next five years. So we're putting in a place to make us um, to look at the financial position, look at an overall approach about how we're going to address it, and in particular, looking at our financial sustainability, which we know that will get picked up as part of value for money reports going forward. So it's early days at this stage in terms of kind of impact of any new government. What I would say is we are working on the assumption we've got some challenging years ahead of us. So irrespective of any changes from government, I think that wouldn't necessarily change the approach. But we're starting that five year planning exercise now uh, and we'll be reporting later in the year to uh, to members. Thanks. I am. Um, I understood. Uh... So I don't know whether this is quite on the on point, but I understood that we the they're changing the funding, so they're going to fund on a longer term basis rather than funding sort of year by year. They're going to fund over a three year basis, and how does that affect how we can actually um, manage our money? So I'm not aware that we've had confirmation yet that they will be. Uh, will be uh, offering a multi-year settlement. However, I think certainly as officers, we've been lobbying quite hard. It was, you know, for the last couple of years, the importance of that. It's really hard to plan year to year. You know, I'm very keen that we are looking at a five-year overall financial position and, and therefore having three to five-year funding arrangements from government would be really important to us in that planning period as opposed to the one-year settlement. So I know there has been... Uh, uh, speculation that we could be moving to that but certainly at the moment that hasn't yet been confirmed so we are certainly working for next year's budget that we will be receiving similar levels of funding as what we receive currently at the moment can i just ask so 
if this goes ahead, I mean, I, I, I thought I it was in the King's speech, but I might be wrong. But if it goes ahead, um, would that mean that rather than having to do things on short term, which actually was more costly, you'd be if you did it on a longer term, it, you could save money by doing so by spreading it. Certainly, as I say, a longer year settlement, certainly three to five years, would enable us to plan across those uh, that longer period of time rather than one year. I always um, I always say one year budget setting is really difficult because you sometimes make short term decisions, whereas actually what we want to be in a position is planning over that five year period. So it would absolutely support in the financial planning for the council. Um, what we don't know at this stage is what that will look like for 25, 26. So I understand there was some mention yesterday, but we don't yet know how long that, how long until that might come into play. Thank you. So, Tim, I have a I have a question. So if you can just uh, so six point thirteen. So months six six point thirteen. So the borrowing has the the loans has increased. From 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 the years, and I think the borrowing is going up and up. What's the what's the benchmark? What is the matrix that how much can you borrow? What's the what's the pause around the borrowing um, the council can take? How do you benchmark it to what assets or what? If you can just provide a bit more details on that, that could be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the six point thirteen you're referring to is that on the um, so the officer report or the appendix? Yeah. Okay. Um. So on the um. So in, in terms of the benchmark, um, there are two key things um that the council uses. There is um uh, something that's referred to as the liability benchmark, which kind of looks at your working capital arrangements and says how much can you borrow maximum if you were just borrowing to um for working capital reasons, so just cash management effectively. Um. So that sets um a limit, and then historically, which I think we've included on this. I'm just trying to find the table. There is um, an operational boundary, which is the limit um, that limits you as to how much you can borrow. And that's set on the basis of um, the capital program, how much the council can afford to borrow. Um, but it's usually used as a extreme case example. And then above that, you have the authorized limit. If you do breach that, you'd have to report um, to the authorities because you're not supposed to breach the authorized limit. And it's meant to really be like the last default position. Um, so I think the, the numbers, um, I don't want to sort of misquote, um, but if I find it's one of the prudential indicators, um, hiring is significantly below both of those. Um, so from that basis, from a treasury management aspect, that's fine. But obviously there's a lot of impact that goes into the cost of borrowing, which is part of the MTFS uh, um, and the cycle and setting to make sure that it's actually affordable. Um, and then there's, um, I think I think the MTFS reports, there's also how much in revenues uh, you can have, but these, there's no set rules on it. It's just a way to measure to make sure that it's um, it's affordable. So the key ones from a treasury perspective are the operational boundary and the authorized limit. So you are uh, currently you are, you are confident that we're in a, we're in a, we're in a good position in terms of where we are? Yes, so I am I'm comfortable that we're not close to breaching those limits. Um, in terms of the financial health of the authority, that's probably one for Tyron to comment on. But from a treasury perspective, um, yeah, we are within our limits. Yeah, and I think certainly um, where we are with the rates as well, we would want to be looking at keeping our borrowing to a minimum. I think, you know, irrespective of our financial position, that's where we'd want to be. So as, as Tim has said, we are within the operational boundaries. However, I we do need to be thinking it does come with a, a borrowing cost, so a revenue implication. So I think just generally across the organisation, we should be looking to keep our borrowing requirements to a minimum where, where, where possible, particularly as well at a time when uh, rates are remaining, we think high, at least across the short term. So... The recommendation for this report is to note the Treasury management activity undertaken during the financial year to 31st of March 2024 and the performance achieved with this uh, attached appendix one to this report. Secondly, to note all the Treasury activities were undertaken in line with the approved Treasury management strategy. Thank you very much, Tim. So I'll move on to the next item, which is the procurement system replacements project update. And I invite the officers to introduce the report. Thank you.
Uh, good evening. Hi, I'm Janine Long. I am the change manager on the e-procurement project for the council. Um, I'm here in place for Don Mason um, and also alongside the Do you want to do Good evening. Yep. Good evening. I'm Barry Phelps. I'm the Chief Procurement Officer and I'll be supporting uh, Janine with any questions relating to procurement in respect of the report. Thank you. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Um, Barry attended uh, the last audit meeting and there were some questions for the digital team. Um, so there were three questions that um, we're, uh, I'm responding to this evening, and that's around the project progress, um, the risks and issues, and uh, the savings considerations, those three specific questions that came up. Um, as far as the um, project progress, we've got five, on, I think, starting on page 35 of the uh, um, report this evening is give some background as far as where those questions came up and section 6.1 and 6.2 give a bit of the background and timeline as far as what we're trying to achieve. Um, to simplify the project, there's five key areas, uh, the data migration of moving the data from the legacy systems to the new system that we're introducing, uh, the workflow configuration, which is setting up the functionality, um, the, the uh, working with the uh, administrators within the team to set up the um, rules and uh, processes for it, uh, and then the onboarding training and learning and the communications that will come as part of that as we ease into the early life support and a business as usual uh, approach on that. Um, there's been an external audit by Mazars, and they'll, the report from that will be out in due course. Um, also, uh, as far as the risks and issues that we were looking at, that starts on a page, a page our risk and issue on, apologies, page 40. Um, and so we have uh, the governance uh, processes in place to capture and address and monitor them. Um, in, there's a review underway of, of an audit of the project that is kicking off, as well as a re review of the project delivering against the requirements. Um, so following the outcome of those, um, we'll report back on, on the outcomes of that. Uh, and then on uh, page 44 is a summary of the savings of, to the question of uh, consolidating the two systems um, and the savings that are, that are forecasted for that. So that's my opening statement. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, so only as far as uh, your note from the procurement comments in the report that there are some concerns with the report. Uh, sorry, with the project at the moment. And as Janine has already said, there's a review which is uh, currently underway, which we anticipate to be completed by the end of next week. And then we'd be able to provide further details in terms of the progress of the report going forward uh, once that review is completed. And that probably stems from if you review some of the risks uh, within the report, um, that leads to why there's a, a review underway at the moment. Thanks. I, I try to, to get through that report. Can I just make a, a, a small point about initials and terminology in it? I find it very difficult to try to work out what BOW is and what what is and Dua Lipa or whatever is the, the things that are in there, Adam, all that kind of thing. It would have been good to have something to help us understand a bit better, you know, that kind of thing. As a general thing, that's a minor bit. I've got uh, just... I'm looking for reassurance that we are going ahead within budget and within timetable. That's that's what I'm reading that report for. And on page 39, I notice about the contract ex contract extensions there, and uh, I just want to check just just as general reassurance: are the costs of this contract extension being contained within the contingency that we had in the budget, or is it something that we asked? for a growth from somewhere else, just uh, just as a general point. In the same page further down, there is a reference as well to training over the global system admins, G GSAs, uh, and uh, 
extensions and, and it's some hierarchy. First of all, you've got the top people being trained and then next ones, etc. So there's a lot more to come. Does that imply that uh, we will and is training and hand holding and all kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. With respect, if you can speak to the mic so we can actually capture what you're saying in terms of the minutes too. So yeah, if you can yeah. speak to the mic, so, that would be the help. Yeah. Thank so, you. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, let me just put that on that side. Uh, so on this one, does it imply uh, that we will have to have a further extensions of some private contractor to do the training, the car holding? Is that within the contingency funding as well? And the last bit, you just touched, Barry, yourself on it, but I was very perplexed on the comments, on the procurement comments on page 31. Um, the first question that raises my mind is, who is the client for that project? Who is really responsible for it? Because I thought it was procurement, but obviously, since you are expressing concerns about the accuracy on it, I would like to know who is the overall responsibility? And is this comment an indication that there are some additional risks that they are than there are in the main report, the body of the report. I think uh, to your question around um, the training, um, as the intention is to train a uh, train the trainer model. So we're training our internal administration and then focusing on super users, the key contract managers, the procurement offices internally, and then moving out to general users and suppliers externally. So we have a good quality experience for them because it's train the trainer inter internally. The intention right now is that there isn't an external resource. We need to do that at this time. No, we don't anticipate extra contracts and extra contact with external providers for that one. It's all built into the model. Correct, yeah, that, that is part of the project cost is the training is included in that. That's part of that package. Yes. Just to reconfirm that then around the training. So it is intended that the training will be delivered by council officers and they're going forward, not external uh, organisations. Um, just in terms of is the budget contained for the additional extensions, um, we'd have to refer that to digital services because it comes under their budget and I have no visibility of that, but we can take that away and uh, come back to you in respect of that. Um, in terms of who has overall responsibility for the um, project, it is digital services, which is why the, the report is drafted from digital services. Um, and yes, I have raised some concerns, which is why the review is underway. Um, so they are taking appropriate action and the concerns that I raised are being addressed through that review. And once that review has been undertaken, then we'll have a better understanding as to whether the, the concerns can be addressed or whether there's further issues relating to that. But at this point in time, it's too early to be able to provide some feedback in respect of that. It means that there are some more risks that are indicated in the report or delays or extra costs. So I think the, so there are some risks, but the risks are predominantly around the functionality and whether the functionality that we've requested uh, will be delivered and also you know, around the time scales as well that we've um, kind of had in mind and what we outset in the original requirement. Um, so there are some issues around that. Um, some of those, or most of those are covered within the table, obviously not in any detail, but a kind of high level. Um, but the important thing is that we're addressing that. We recognize that there are some issues, which is why the review is underway at the moment. So just, uh, just the new director of finance. I, I would be grateful if you just look at this issue about the the, the costs and whether they're contained in the budget, etc. Don't need to to tell me, but just I want to know that you looked at it. <laughs> the cost of the project is in the report. My understanding when I read it, but that's fine. But if that can be taken on board, that will be helpful. If you want to come in, thank you. 
if if I could, and what um, so I think you know certainly I will look into the budget, and and it's it's a really important pro project for the organisation. Um, I think you know procurement and contracts, etc really big area to spend so it is really important and therefore you know really uh, supporting the review that's underway at the moment because it is you know just for us to take time to reflect and ensure that we are putting the right process and the right project management in place to get this um, implemented and I know we're going to come back to you and talk to you later at the next meeting just around procurement more generally and around compliance around contract management absolutely you know the technology that we're trying to put in place here is absolutely fundamental to supporting what we want to achieve wider in that space so absolutely councillor I can assure you it is on my radar um, particularly from uh, procurement seats within my directorate but also from a wider budget perspective but just the importance of it but thank you noted. Councillor Mappo. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is my first meeting back in order, um, but I remember having these um, conversations in 2022. So just uh, just wanted to first congratulate you. And uh, yeah, it's really reassuring to see an end date to this. Finally, um, it's it's really good to see. Um, but if if memory serves me right, in 2022 there was a kind of a, a an illusion that we'd um, we'd work with other local authorities on creating the system and and, and creating something that would be because I know local other local authorities such as uh, Enfield had similar problems. Is that still the case? Whereas I guess this paper kind of says it's tailor made for Haringey. So I just wanted to be sure what, yeah, what, where it is actually. So the supplier that we chose, Panacea, is already in place with other councils. Um, we also already use their services for one of our departments, one of our service areas. So they do serve um, quite a variety of councils as well. Just to add to that, so um, we have explored trying to work with other authorities in terms of some procurement platforms more regionally. Um, that's been really challenging because everyone's at different points and everyone has different digital strategies as well. So it's not just the procurement uh, platform, it's also the finance systems, HR systems, the LP. And th at the moment, there, there's quite a change that's going in and around London. Um, but it's still on my radar, and if we can find opportunities, then I'm more than happy to explore those. Okay, yeah, that's it. So, Councillor Mason. Thank you, um, and thanks a lot for this. The a couple of questions. First of all, I'm assuming that you are going to do some testing of the um, system before it goes live, and that you'll be doing that with um, you, with the operators at the coal face, if you like. Yeah. Yes. Um, great. Thank you. And also, I'm also assuming that we know these kinds of projects have gone terribly wrong elsewhere. And so I'm assuming you're putting breaks where necessary to make sure that testing um, is in place so that we will know before we get to the end of it that there are problems arising. Uh, yes, on page 39 are some key gateways, um, and those are key points to, to, to evidence exactly that, that the testing, the data migration, the usability is in place at that, those points. Right. Um, and my final question is, um, well, there's two things. First of all, um, I like the way that you've raised the risks and issues, uh, which are very honest and open, so that makes me feel a bit more reassured, even though the overall project has got quite a few difficulties. Um, but I feel, I feel like it's been guided because you are pointing out the difficulty. So, um, yeah, that, I really value that. And so I'd really like to continue in that with that approach. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to um, raise is this issue of having no external resource and wondering how, when something, if something goes wrong, how you're going to be assured that you have the best advice possible in order to put right what's gone wrong, if you see what I mean. So is that in the the stability of the system we're moving to that we're we're going to Panacea or when you say external? Yeah, so I think that um, when we were talking about the costings, um, you were saying that the costings would not attract, um, that they wouldn't suddenly become instead of 10 million, 100 million, as we know does happen. Um, and that you, because we were using internal resources, we had more, we were able to track that better. 
Uh, so along with something going wrong, there is also, of course, whether you have got in-house the speciality. And so I'm wanting to know that there is the possibility of bringing help and resources in within the budget. I'd, I'd have, yeah, I'd have to take that away specifically of what the budget allocation is. Right. As far as the subject matter expertise of using the system, building that out internally, especially that train the trainer model that we were just talking about, um, that will be all internal resources. Yeah. Um, we will be uh, tapping into our internal digital resources for interfacing to the SAP, mm. the finance systems, um, and then the Panacea tool is an out of the box. So it's not customized just for us. It's using the functionality that multiple councils are using so that we're not the only ones using those tools okay. um, and the panacea is obviously um, in place for those other councils as well if that answers your question yeah that's that's helpful the i suppose the big thing really is that when something goes wrong sometimes it goes terribly wrong and it doesn't mean that it's anybody's fault but sometimes it's hard to identify what's happened and so i just wanted to be sure that the budget included um the included some leeway um, so that we can make sure that we don't get trapped into a cycle of things spinning out of control okay yeah let, let we'll take that away because um as far as functionality for the uh, working system a disaster recovery business continuity is also part of that assessment that we want to make mm. sure is in place um and as far as delivering the project i, I think like Matt barry mentioned earlier we've got an audit of the project underway as well as a review of the project against the requirements to mitigate it uh, mitigate that great thank you thanks Chair. Hi. Um, I, I read the report and I guess I'm struggling with 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 the sense of um, where the project is versus its plan. Um, and I, what I didn't get from from the from, from from the report was this is what was planned by these dates, but we're here now and this is the um, projected new projected timelines. So if, if you can help us understand that, that would be great. Sure. So on page 38 um, is a high level timeline. The top half of that is the technical delivery. And there's three key stage gates of functionality being delivered. So there's three. Oops, sorry. Oh, on the, OK, maybe it's 30, page 34, the hard copy, the kind of the colorful bar calendar um, view. Um, the. Uh, so we've got three stage gates and the, the yellow stars on there represent uh, milestones of functionality being delivered. So it's data migration, um, the configuration, the testing, the go live of that module, such that by the end of October, all three modules are available and the full end to end um, a solution is, is in place. So our timeline and the gateways represent those three key milestones are have we met that have, have the supplier met the functionality and met our requirements. And that's why we're constantly rechecking those gateways to make sure that each of those modules as a whole by the end of October will be fully functional for our needs. So I guess we'll be saying that, that there's been no slippage of. So perhaps if I can come in on this point. So what you what you see in terms of the timetable there was the kind of the more recent timetable that was developed a bit while a, a few weeks back. Part of the reason that the review is being undertaken at the moment is because we have serious concerns that we are able to deliver to that timetable. So that is why the review is, is currently looking at that. So. There are issues, which is you know why I mentioned earlier that timescales was one of the concerns that we had and why that's been referred. So once the review has been undertaken, then we can kind of take stock of actually where are they in terms of delivering the functionality that we expect at various points in time, then we'd be able to provide more of an update uh, once that review has been completed. Do we know when that review will be completed, Barry? Yeah, so my understanding is by the end of next week, that review should have been undertaken. Um, I, and I guess that's that's the, the heart of my question uh, in terms of communicating to this body. Um, what we've planned to do, what we've done and what we've what we realized are issues. Um, and as Councillor Mason said, kudos to you guys to put putting it out there. 
Um, but I guess it's important for for this committee to to understand what are the on the ground issues that could possibly prevent this project from not being success, successful, um, and then also the cost related to that. So, and I guess it just goes into my next question around the sun page. So you had you had a savings. Um, yeah, page forty. Um, and and I, I guess I didn't understand those figures in in, in terms of saying was the four hundred four hundred five thousand the budgeted cost for this project. So that is specific. Um, this project, by introducing new software, is replacing two old pieces of software. So those numbers specifically relate to shutting down those two. The license cost for those two um, pieces of software replaced with a panacea, and what and this, the new software and what that savings is. Yeah. So I I guess from from a committee perspective, and what I would have liked to see is a, a budgeted cost for the project. Uh, versus the actual spend and what the projected spend is based on all the issues that are coming out or that we are highlighting at the moment. Yeah. And I also add to that question, so yeah, I think it would be worthwhile to, uh, to know a bit more about what's the, the savings for subsequent years when this project has been implemented compared to previous years. And that would be really helpful to know what the actual savings is. It annual savings? Is it monthly savings? Don't know. But I think if you can maybe um, calculate that, what that will look like. And I think one of the areas in, since is on this topic uh, is about what is the maintenance arrangement with, with with the company. So, for example, if something goes wrong, do we need to pay? Is it part of that package for the maintenance of the of the the platform? Probably better off answering that one uh, in terms of the contract. So, in terms of the contract, the contract's fixed. There's only sort of some CPI uplift uh, in relation to some of the uh, licenses. If we require developments or additional modules over and above what we have specified at the moment, then there will be additional cost, but that would be subject to the relevant gateways that are being put in place by digital service at the moment. Um, so apart from that, at the moment, it is a fixed, it's a fixed price contract. There are fixed rates and there are fixed license costs associated with it. So unless there are client changes, um, and at the moment we have not put forward any client changes, but that is also subject to the review and the assessment of the functionality that's being developed. Uh, at the moment to ensure that it meets our requirements. So what we're trying to do is to try and retain the uh, standard functionality as much as possible with the relevant controls and workflows in there. Um, but at the moment, we've not seen all of the functionalities, so we've not been able to identify if there are any gaps that may require some additional uh, amendments to the system. So. At the moment, we're saying there's no additional cost kind of being incurred in terms of the project, other than potentially those that are related to um, increasing or extending the existing licenses for the current systems if there's a delay in relation to this project. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, on, on this particular point, to say, but I think. To me, obviously, I want to make sure that we are there isn't a cost creep you like and extend it, etc. But that's not the main issue. The reason why we needed all that is because a number of audits here raised concerns about various aspects and other concerns from elsewhere. And the answer often was we need a new IT system and a new way of doing it, etc. And therefore that refers to what I assume you call the functionality. All right. So that is my worry at the moment is that's why I asked on your comment as well. It's not just the cost. I mean, if it would needed more cost in order to ensure the functionality would be working, then let's discuss it. Let's, let's that's not the priority, although it is an issue as well in the present statements. But the main thing is, are we going to end up 
with the same budget or even a bit more, but something that doesn't work, it doesn't answer, it doesn't answer the questions we had of the previous audit. That's the, the key point. Yes, just quickly on that. So that, you know, that is the purpose of the review is to be able to assess the functionality to ensure that it is aligned to what we went to market with and what we were expecting to be delivered. Um, you know, in terms of the cost and the budget, really the focus has been more around the functionality and is it going to deliver it and when is it going to be able to be delivered um, as opposed to is there a risk in terms of additional costs being drawn in from that but that will all be factored into the review. Councillor Rossetti, then I'll come to you Councillor Brennan. Um, it might be something that our independent member might have already asked, but sometimes it's very difficult to hear because sometimes people speak too far from the phone or they speak with a soft voice. So um, I wanted to go back to the timeline. That's why I think maybe you already asked, uh, responded to. Um, on page 35, there is this uh, table with a lot of activities not started yet. And uh, I can see that the timetable on page 34 is one month old. So I was just wondering if those recommendations that you were mentioning at the beginning refer to the fact that a lot of activities also have not started yet and are going to address that. Thanks. So in terms of the table that's uh, on page, uh, I think it's 36 in the pack, is it? 35. 35. Um, okay, just... Oh, okay, so no, I'll let Janine answer that one okay. then, because that's, sorry, I thought you just answered No, that, that's fine. Um, so the the one that's on uh, page 35 reflects the um, change management activities as far as communications, training, and the activities have that have started since May and that have been, go that are planned to go through the life cycle of the project. Uh, the timeline that's on, I believe, page 34, um, section 6, Point four point nine uh, reflects where we've reassessed the timeline um, starting in June, and um, and as Barry pointed out, the the review is underway to validate that that timeline is still uh, going to be achievable. Yes, so I can see that on this uh, table on page thirty five, a lot of activities have not yet started with a target date on nineteen of August, yes. which is in a month time. Yes, so so that represents the gateways of uh, the activities that need to happen. Data needs to be put into the system such that we can actually train users in an end to end process such that they can test it and then we can start training people. So um, we have loaded um, all aspects of data except one part, which is finishing up. So that's why those are reflected as not yet started. Um, we need to get that data in there and then we can validate that the functionality works the way we expect it to. Okay, thanks. Maybe I need to reformulate. Are they supposed not to be started yet at this stage or should have been started already and therefore there is a delay that needs to be factored in somewhere else? I understand now. Um, yes, there. I think we were expecting the data to have been loaded um, because there were some um, delays in the configuration and retrieving the data from the legacy, the old systems, it's been slightly delayed. It's actually timed with the functionality of the, the design and configuration of the system okay. Um, so, so far, although there's, that's why we raised some risks and concerns about migrating that data, um, but we're monitoring that and the review will um, evidence whether we we're, we're, can maintain that on, on time because there's certain activities we can do in parallel versus their sequential that need to be done. That answers your uh, Yes, I mean, this is why my question was really if the project will be on schedule considering those delays. So I apologize that, if this that, has yeah, been already no, asked and the responded. The simple answer is the, re the review is going to answer that question for us. We will be complete by next week. Uh, the intention is by the end intention. of next week that the review will complete such that we'll release the report for that. Thank you. So um, I had pretty well everybody's comments in my mind. So I'm, I was worried about this staying on time. I'm worried about the fact that I'm not sure that we have enough staff to train and to learn or whether the training is going to be going to fit. 
so that you're going to be able to keep on time from that perspective. So I feel it's the whole thing is a bit risky. But what I'm really concerned about is the transparency of the whole system in that when I joined the um, audit committee, I noticed there were basic questions that had been asked previously by the corporate committee that hadn't been answered, and it seemed unusual to me. So I sort of said, can't you do some sort of manual look just to tell us the basic answers? And we were told, no, we have to wait for the system. It was impossible to answer really quite basic questions. Um, and now this system is being delayed by, I don't know, I think it's going to be delayed. I don't think we can keep to this timetable. It's, so it's going to be like um, maybe there was a year, six months not answering the questions before I became on to the audit committee. And now there's going to be another 18 months before this comes on. It's like two years. It's quite extraordinary in the context of having said that there might have been fraud going on, um, as I read in the papers. It seems quite extraordinary that we can't have more transparency and we couldn't look at the previous system. Yeah, I'm just, well, my basic thing is, is do you think you have the staff, staff in, in place to um, get the training and be trained and obtain the training? Really, that's my question. So, partly it's down to the training approach as well that we're adopting. So, we do, it will be my team that is leading on the training so that staff not only get training in terms of um, the system, but also the new procurement processes that are coming in. Most of the most of the activity in terms of procurement will be centralised into my department going forward. Um, so that kind of narrows down some of the intense training uh, within the system itself. There is broader corporate training that's required, so for contract managers and also for people that will be procuring below £25,000. That will be a hybrid of kind of online training material and uh, sessions going forward. So do we have the resources? From what we understand at the moment, we believe we do, but until we've assessed the level of training that's required across the whole of the council, which we've not done yet, um, we've just based it upon information that we know around user profiles at the moment. So once we've done that uh, assessment, then we will know if there's more of an issue there or not um, going forward. Do we think that the new system is going to um, sort of prevent the, help us um, sort of like uh, dig out the fraud that that's, is suggested that there was fraud found previously in what I've read here? So certainly there will be enhanced controls throughout the whole of the system, which will help minimise it, whether you can eradicate it totally is, uh, I, I wouldn't like to say, um, but there are, there's a lot more transparency and there are a lot more controls which will be in the new system. Just coming on that point, and I've got a question from an independent member. So will the system have some sort of learn analytics that can provide statistics about, you know, the, the tenders, the procurement? Will that provide that kind of detailed analytics? So in terms of the scope, yes, analytics was absolutely a key part of the requirements because, you know, we can use data much more effectively than what we currently do to inform our procurement strategies, understand markets, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, the intention is that there's actually two phases to this. So there's the first one, which is providing us with enhanced reporting capability and using things like tools like Power BI and stuff like that to assist us in terms of understanding the data. But there's also been conversations had with digital services around going beyond that and potentially uh, using AI to give us further insight into um, data and how we can best use that. But the first step is to get the system in place and then we'll look to see if there's any added value in terms of uh, additional stuff going forward. Thank, Thank you, you, Barry. So, Rhea, you got a question? 
Hi there. You want to come? Hi, we yes. can hear you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to to the officers. So, so just a couple of things. So I sort of feel slightly confused as to what it is that we are expecting from this review board that is scheduled for the 30th. Are we expecting a re-baselined plan? Is that the output that we are expecting? For the review, um, it's very much focused on making sure that the functionality um, and is meeting the requirements that we've asked for um, that are originally part of the tender and the contract. Um, based on that outcome, um, then we'll be able to report back of whether it's fit for purpose. Um, so this is very much around uh, the quality and the scope of what the uh, system is able to do. Okay. Is this review coming too late? in the process given that delivery is expected to be imminent it feels slightly late from from my perspective i i would want to make sure the digital team um you know back when i'm saying but I, at this time it seems the right time to do it because we've been working through um, monitoring and uh, conducting uh, due diligence around managing risks and issues. Um, and uh, risks are the possibility of something happening versus the issues of they're actively happening. Um, so based on the risks and issues that we've identified now, that's where the review has been initiated to validate and get more of a neutral um, uh, perspective on making sure that the project is still going to be meeting our requirements. Thank you. And, and so Based on the most recent project delivery assessment, what is the rating of this project? In I, terms of red, amber, green? I would have to come back to you on that um, because we have just uh, finished the Mazars audit and the report needs to come out on that. OK, and just one final thing for me, if I may, is it would be really helpful, if possible, to share when this um, project was initially signed off and funding was afforded, what the monetary benefits uh, were going to be to clarify kind of how that stacks up against the sort of stipulated kind of 25, 26 in year saving of 32 grand. That sounds uh, slight, slightly on the low side from, from my perspective. Yeah, we'll, so we'll take that away and uh, feed that back to uh, digital services to come up with. What I will also add is because I think there's going to be slight delay with this implementation with this project, and the, currently there there are two systems in in operation. So maybe trying to look into that how that would be into the licensing because if there's presumably there will be delay on this. So the license arrangement with the existing system. So you may need to look into that when that expires whether you need to extend that period. So you may normally it's year. So be a bit cautious about those two systems in addition to the new system and then the license arrangement because that will have ultimately have costs attached to it. Yeah, so that's already in flight. Yeah. One last question. Then we have to and, Thank you. And I'm sorry, uh, I know we, we, we're going on about this, uh, but I think it's important. Um, the review we make in reference to um, I, I'm, I'm concerned that I don't really understand the scope of this because um, at one point we spoke about the risk that we identified on, on this project that will uh, probably cause it not to be successful or not. And the review, as I understood it then, was to see if we have highlighted all the risks and that the mitigation that we put in place are sound enough. So what from Rena's question, now it sounds that the review is around, does the system meet our requirements? And those are two different things. So the, um, as far as the um, getting access to the system so we can see it as a working model, we got the first um, module just recently. So getting that first hands-on experience of it identifies where there are some functionality um, gaps that we want to make sure that we're still able to do end-to-end uh, -to -end tasks. Um, the 
con there were contract signing delays. I don't certainly correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so our timeline overall was compressed. So um, we are still um, in somewhat early stages in the project, um, but the risks and issues are being um, monitored um, weekly and mitigated and adjusted and acted upon. So it's not, um, it's, it's something that we're, we weren't keen to be transparent and we've got the right governance on it um, with the project board. Sorry, sorry, Chair. I, I'm still a little bit unclear, and I think it would probably be easier if the if we could have a copy of the Mazar scope um, at, at some at some point outside of the meeting. It would make a lot more sense. Yeah. So perhaps if I can clarify that. So there, there's two reviews. There is one review which looks at the overall governance, which was undertaken by external auditors, and. Um, I'm not sure if the, the report's being finalised in terms of that. There is then a separate review, which is a, a being led by the project and senior, senior members in digital services, which is looking at the functionality, the timelines and the project itself and, what, and the deliverables within that. So apologies if there was some confusion ar around those two different reviews there. I know this is really quick. So, yeah. But I want to just come back to the contract that we signed. So we signed a contract which is at a fixed price for the project. If we go back um, to make any changes to that contract, um, are, is there a break clause? Are there is there a, a, the possibility of changing uh, within the fixed price parts of the contract? So yeah, what is the scope of that? have to double check to see if there's a break clause specifically a break clause within the contract itself Do, would we want to go back and revisit the contract personally i feel the contract was very clear in terms of what we were looking for from a deliverable perspective and i do expect the provider to adhere to those requirements that are in the contract and that's part of the digital services review that's being undertaken uh, at the moment. So um, obviously we can change the contract, but I'm very conscious of what has come before audit committee, the requirements, the, you know, the compliance that we need, the transparency, the visibility, the bringing together of all of the different systems that we currently got. And that's really where the baseline is in terms of the contract itself. You might well bring up different issues and so that could affect the contract itself or not potentially it uh, depends upon what issues are identified but there are clear milestones and deliverables within the contract and if they're not adhered to then you know the, then we we look to see if there's any breaches i think what we really need to do is wait and see what's happened you know with the review take stock of what that review says and then kind of understand what the implications are in relation to that. Can I bring Tyron in? Yeah, th thank you, Chin. I, I know so uh, time's quite tight. So I think there's some really legitimate questions that have been and concerns that have been raised today. Can I make it? And I think they range right from almost original contract right through to current spend at the moment against budget. So I think they are really legitimate. And perhaps if we could bring together uh, to the next audit committee, I think a, maybe a joint report by, I guess, kind of for uh, digital services and procurement that covers the range of issues that's been talked about today because I think actually what we need to do is there's lots of different pieces of work underway that we've talked about a couple of different reviews I know Mazars have done other exercises other internal audit reviews I think it'd be really helpful for this committee particularly given that it's been gone going on for a couple of years to try and bring that all together as a single update and because uh, I think at the moment you're trying to piece together various bits of the jigsaw um, and I think maybe as officers if we could bring back a fuller update at the next committee that'd be really in October and I think that chimes quite nicely with the further update that we want to bring, bring more widely on procurement. Thank you, Chair. For me, I know obviously officers are looking at the contract and there's a review going on. Um, I just want to say really that obviously it, 
depending on the outcome of the review, if there are concerns, serious concerns, about whether the provider is able to deliver the functionality that they have signed up to deliver in a timely fashion without the council having to go be put to more expense, then obviously I'm sure officers will obtain legal advice with a view to what action might need to be taken. And obviously, the more, if there is a need, to call a halt to the contract, then the quicker that's done, the better, generally speaking. Um, so it's possible that if it is a severe breach, if it is fundamental and goes to the heart of the contract, it might well be a repudiatory breach of the contract, which would entitle the council to terminate the contract um, and expect that the uh, supplier would put the council into the position it would have been in if the contract had been performed properly. Thank you for that reassurance. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll move on to the next item, which is item not. So we are, I have to read the recommendation so we can agree first. So the uh, the recommendation for this report is that audit committee notes the progress to date and the mitigating actions against the risk and issues. Secondly, to note that the, the proper time, the external audit by Mozart in June 20, 2024 will be presented to the committee and the recommendation followed. Is that noted? Uh, of the discussion, something should be changed on the second part of the recommendation to say we note also problems that they, they exist with the, you know, other kind of thing. Yeah, as but as we as can as add as 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 concerns. Concerns. The functionality yeah. Yeah. We yeah. note the concerns, okay? Yeah. Sorry, Jim. Go on. Um, it's, it's just a language thing, um, and I, I guess I don't want to make the external auditors nervous, but we shouldn't refer to the review as an external audit by Mazars because it's not. No, no, of course, that's, yeah. that's internal operations review. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Right, so we move on to the next item, which is item nine, uh, draft statements of accounts. Can I now invite the officers to introduce the report? Lead Officer Casey. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members and colleagues. Um, I'm here. My name is Casey Kegu. I'm the Chief Accountant, and I'm here with my colleague, Sir Kamanda, um, to present the draft um, statement of accounts for 2023-24. Um, as stated in the cover report, this is not a decision report, but it's just for your noting. But I think I have to quickly mention that at this stage, like the name, um, the title of the report is a draft report. It hasn't gone through external audit work yet. Um, one key thing or you know, one important thing about this report being presented to you at this stage is that we're here also to take notes and observations so that we can go back where the warrant amendments to the um, um, draft statement of accounts will do that and um, it will go through audit as part of the normal audit process. Um, the draft statement of accounts um, by the accounts and audit regulation is meant to be prepared by the 31st of July every year. Um, the regulation also makes provision for where the authority is not able to do that. The authority will make a disclosure or, uh, on the publish on their um, websites why they were not able to. Uh, publish accounts and uh, possibly give a reasonable time frame for them to do that. And um, this year we weren't able to publish by the 31st of July, but we did 31st of May, sorry, but we did um, publish on the 28th of June. And we actually made the notification of delay as required under the regulation. As you know, the draft statement of accounts um is quite a prescriptive document um is divided into um four statements where you have the comprehensive income and expenditure statements the balance sheet the cash flow and the movement in reserves accounts there are also some other supplementary accounts um or statements that constitutes the entire statement of a of accounts, for, especially for 23-24. And those are the housing revenue accounts, the collection funds, the pension fund, and the AGS. 
annual governance statements as part of the whole accounts. Um, I want to bring your attention to some key aspects of this. It's quite a very big document, about 180 pages, but all it tells you is about the council's performances in 2023-24. So I want to bring your attention to a few um, key or highlights um, in the accounts regarding our performances in the year. But I also want to mention that um, we have, as part of the, this account, there's a section we call the narratives to the um, statement of accounts. You see that in pages 55 to 67 of this document. Um, it just simplifies a lot of um, the pages that looks very complex in terms of our performances, in terms of the financial outlook of the council going forward. So I'm sure some of you would have um, Almost all of you would have gone through those pages. But um, the key highlights I want to bring to your attention, one is on page 105 of this document. And that talks about our general fund balances. So in 23-24, we ended up with a general fund balance of 67.4 million as against 97.2 million from last year. That's the um, end of March 2023. And basically what it means that our general fund balance dropped. And the um, reason for that is that we had some overspend in 23-24, and we had to utilize some of those earmarked balances to um, make up for the overspend that we had in the year. And on the housing revenue account, um, our housing revenue account balance increased from 21.6 for 2022-23 to 22.3 million uh, in 2023-24. On the council balance sheet, there was an increase of 158 million in 23-24 compared to 22-23. And that's largely driven by um, valuations in capital, in investment and property plants and equipment. I want to state that within the entire statement of accounts, um, there are no material transactions in the year that required separate disclosures. Um, it's more like business as usual. Um, we have a very simple account, I will say. Um, it should also be noted um, that at this stage, th this is our declaration at this stage until maybe the auditors go through it. They might have issues that they will raise as part of the audit, which will be discussed when next they bring the audit report to, to your attention. And as part of the publication of statement of accounts, uh, once the account is published, there's a period of public inspection. And we published on the 28th, and that period of public inspection commenced on 1st of July, 2024, and will end on Friday, 9th of August, 2024. So during that period, the entire public, anyone can actually review the statement of accounts and um, either ask questions or request for documents to have a better understanding of the finances or raise objections. I think um, the audit partner mentioned that as part of his presentation earlier. So we are still in that period. It will end 4 p.m. on the night. And um, so far, we haven't really had much coming through from the public on the accounts. So what's the next step for us? Um, after tonight's session, um, we've started, the KPMG has started preliminary um, review into this account. So the audit will commence, or I would say has already commenced. So the next step would be for them to actually go through the audit process. And then once that is completed, um, they will come back to the audit committee with their recommendations and reports. I think um, that covers um, my presentation. It's quite a big document and um, very difficult to go through. We don't know where to start from. So I will um, pause here for questions from members. I have 
Councillor Daigidis. Yeah, come in, come in. Yeah, thanks, 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 Casey. Look, it's a lot of information, obviously, the whole thing, but uh, I would just want to ask a couple of questions or comment on two broad strategic things. The first thing is about all the outstanding audits and the timetable, etc. Our external auditor covered part of it before the explanation. Now this, I find it very difficult. It's almost a mind bending between the years and all that kind of thing. So I wonder, Chair, whether through you I can ask our external auditor to give us a frank, open advice here. Are we doing well as an authority in, in the context of what the difficulties going on around around, or should we try something better? Can you advise us? So I, as a backbencher, feel reassured that, you know, I know our officers very well, actually, that in, in that particular field, and you know, I don't have any criticisms whatsoever. I know how hard you have worked in the past, how we met deadlines in the past, deadlines in the past. Absolutely, there is not an issue of criticizing, but I just want some reassurance, independent <laughs> that we are on on that thing. The second bit, though, I want to raise is just one issue that is covered here. Uh, I wasn't, I should have been aware, but I wasn't aware that in 23-24, according to the still draft unaudited accounts. We actually reduced our balances by circa 30 million pounds, or, or roughly, yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, and that there have been a huge overspend on certain things. That are, there might be bloody good reasons, I'm sure there are, you know, because we are quite good at, at handling. But is it this something that we should be worrying about, you know, at this moment in time? It's not something to just gloss over. 30 million reduction suddenly in one year because of overspend over what we had planned to spend. So that these are the, the two questions I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dekides. I know you. the first question was um, meant for KPMG to answer, but let me just quickly say that um, they are very new. <laughs> so, so, so they've just started. I'm not sure um, <laughs> if Tim will be able to give you the assurance you need. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Casey needn't be worried. Um, I, I think what I would say, which is part evasion, part honesty, is all it is a process. And I think it'd be completely premature for me to sit here today and offer assurance or nervousness about the process that we're about to go through. What I will say, which is absolutely factually correct, is we have met with positive engagement from the authority. So Bearing in mind that you are unfamiliar with the approach of external audit over the last couple of years, we had a nervousness upon appointment that you would be very risk averse in how you interact with us and how you share information. But I can tell you the contrary is true. In fact, you know, at one occasion, one of our auditors sat over there, was inundated with people wanting to take part in a walkthrough test over one of your revenue processes, simply because it is a novelty. And a lot of finance professionals welcome the scrutiny that external audit give them, and that's the way it should be. So I offer you that assurance. I also say, you know, in no small part due to, to Saar and Casey, you know, you've got a 180 page document in front of you. A lot has been said about the complexity and the length of local authority accounts. And I think that's something SIPFA is working on. But to actually get to a point where you're producing a set of accounts covering the operations as large and diverse as a local authority as this is a fair achievement in and of itself. So obviously we are there to provide assurance on those contents, but I can't do that today. We need to follow the process. Thank you, Chair. And if I just come back on the second question around the uh, the use of balances and the overspend position, I think on page 60, there's a table there that summarises um, the drawdown from reserves that we've had to make at the end of 23-24, uh, 19.2 million. Um, that isn't isn't where we want to be, um, you know, 19.2 million overspend in a drawdown reserve. We know what's driving that. We know it's around social care. We know it's around temporary accommodation. Um, we, you know, we understand the drivers of that. But either way, we, we, we don't want to be in that position going forward in the future years. 
two reasons and I'll come on to them briefly but the first is you know you'll you will pick up from the accounts that our levels of reserves aren't, aren't excessively high actually I would probably you know fairly new into the role I would describe them as being more on the low end compared to our comparator authorities and again that isn't where we would want to be so certainly my approach over the next couple of years is I'd want to be building up those reserves to a prudent level that you know we are facing a lot of uncertainty over the next few years and I just want us to be in a position that we've got those reserves for those unexpected events should they should they uh uh should they arise. Um, I suppose just trying to avoid that level of overspend in future years. So I won't go into the detail, but just say we're very actively working on next year's budget now. And one of those uh, parts of the jigsaw I describe it as, it's really understanding what some of those pressures are that are coming through. So some of the work that we're doing at the moment is looking at what was driving that overspend last year, that 19.2 million, and what's the impact it's going to have in the current year. 24, 25, but also future years as well. So, you know, already without ongoing new pressures, it is going to be very challenging. It's going to be difficult, but it's really important that we have that full visibility and transparency about um, the budget pressures that we are facing in future years. And I think certainly the information you're seeing here is that data and insight that I'm certainly really trying to get to the bottom of at the moment. So, you know, our levels of reserves wouldn't facilitate funding and overspend of that level for many years, and therefore we need to we need to be very very proactive in terms of looking at our budget position and not having that reliance on reserves because they aren't there, as well as growing them slightly. Hopefully, that's kind of give you answered the question broadly. But um, but um, yeah, I I think it's it's uh it's not a sustainable position for us to be in kind of over the next three to four years thanks thank you any any more questions no yep yeah, and and i think uh the the mention of reserves came up and and my question is kind of related to that um you said the level of reserves are, are lower than peers um, how do, how does that level compare to some of the councils that are, have already declared bankruptcy? Well, uh, are you saying where we are in terms of yeah, in, 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 in terms of the the level of reserves, how how do our level of reserves compare to some of the councils that have uh, issued one one four notices? So, so um, I I wouldn't like to say factually how we compare. All I all I can say is that we look at the benchmarking information that we've got, particularly um there is information published by certain government departments, so some of it is really useful. And then certainly the information on reserves is which shows that we are low compared to our uh, neighbours. Some of those will have announced uh, 114, some of those may be at risk, but some of those aren't. There are a lot of drivers for what we believe is a prudent level of reserves that we should be holding. Um, and it isn't just around, um, so those that have issued section 114s, the, the level of reserves will not be the only reason for that. And therefore, it's really important, I think, that we don't assume a direct correlation between one and the other. However, that doesn't change the update that I just gave in response to the previous question. We are lower than what we'd want to be in terms of comparative authorities, but we have a window of opportunity. You know, I, I'm very much of the belief that we are still in control, but we need to kind of look at taking that action now. And one of those is building up that level of reserves, not excessively, but just to a level where we just feel comfortable that if those unexpected events do happen, that we have got uh, that um, uh, that resilience behind us. Yeah, I, th I think. Um, yeah, sorry, my, there was no impl uh, implication that uh, we anywhere close to one one four. Um, I, I guess without the the auditor's assurance as such, um, my role um, and like the other committee members would, would try to identify as many red flags as possible. Uh, potentially. That's all. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask about in your narrative report, um, you're talking about where the overspend and where that 
the weather borrowing from reserves, if you like, or the transfer from reserves has had to take place. Um, and I just wanted to be assured that all those different um, departments where there have been quite big overspends have looked, to, have they been in a way challenged to look at why those overspends are there and how they can be reduced in the coming year? Yeah, so thank you. I think so. I think I'm five weeks or six weeks into the role. So I imagine all the way through 23, 24, uh, that that challenge would have taken place. So we do do monthly and quarterly monitoring. So throughout throughout 23, 24, uh, that would have uh, taken place. So I I, d I don't want to rehearse kind of last year, but what I would say is the absolute work that's going on at the moment. So uh, th what you're looking at here now is the uh, the statement of accounts, what was considered by Cabinet last Tuesday and what is going to review the scrutiny committee is what we call the outturn report. And so that is a, um, a much more detailed uh, outline in terms of what's driving that overspend and the reasons why. So, you know, if you are interested, I would encourage you not only to read the narrative report, but also to look at that outturn report as well, because it, it just describes it in a bit more of a, I would say, a, a, a simpler language than maybe what you see in the statement of accounts. So I would encourage you to do that. But I think it links to that piece of work that we've got underway at the moment about really understanding. We know what was driving the overspend now. We know the reasons. The really important is that we make sure that we understand that does it impact on 24, 25? Does it impact on future years? And if it does, what is the action that we're taking place uh, to mitigate some of those pressures? Thank you. I think what we tend to do as councillors is to consider that um, the reason for us having that deficit is because of adult community care and uh, the, the issues that are kind of big political issues, if you like. But when I look at this, I can see that some of the things that have been raised in audit as concerns, like voids, um, like um, increase in legal costs for disrepair cases, um, all of which with kind of improved systems in place you could avoid and so I, that's what I'm looking at really about how we save where we can without interrupting services um, and where we uh, where we've got bigger issues that we need to think about in a macro way. Yeah, and, and the work that's underway at the moment in terms of looking at not just next year's budget, that, but future year's budget, and I talked earlier about the importance about looking over the next at least two to three years, is that real importance of looking at our own internal processes, as well as, you know, there will be some services where we're always going to face increased demand, particularly around social care, particularly around temporary accommodation. What is really important that we're looking internally that we've got our processes right we are as efficient as we possibly can you know ranging from using digital technology right through that end-to-end -end process all of that work is underway at the moment as part of our budget planning as well as being really honest about what some of those demand pressures are so I'm a really big advocate that we should be going in with a budget that we absolutely believe reflects the pressures that we are going to be facing. Otherwise, you're immediately starting off the year on a back foot if you haven't. And, you know, it's assumptions. Uh, you're never going to get it exactly right, but it, it's really important that we use all the data and insight that we've got to get the budget in the right position to avoid that significant overspend uh, kind of in future years. Thanks. That's like diabetes. Just can I just uh, make make clear? I think, uh, in my mind, there is is not just a matter of financial control. It's also about financial planning. In other words, all right, we're uh, overspending over our uh, plans, but it could be not because we didn't control the expenditure properly. It's because we had the wrong target in the first place in the planning and that is one of the questions we've got to be very careful i personally think that we do have uh, in comparison the old history of that borrow and a lot of other london borrows in particular we got a healthy healthy level of balances i remember having negative balances neither my having still even after that reduction 90 million at least of balance contingencies etc so it's quite significant but there is a correlation in my mind between our confidence on our financial planning and financial control 
and the level of balance and resources. The benchmarking gives us some idea, but you know, but if I feel confident that our plans are clear and achievable, and uh, our systems are controlling everything, and there's no kind of some slush fund that everybody just goes in, then I'm quite happy that we reduce the balances in order to meet the objectives we want. The point is to get what we want to do. So that's that's really where the the the, the the game is from my from my perspective, and uh, that's the assurances I'm looking for for you. And it's good that we do have, as well, a change of personnel every now and then, because uh, you know we, we can take a fresh look at all of that and say, do we really need that many balances? You know, etc. Are we really planning properly and with with confidence? Or the first day of the new year? Suddenly, we're predicting an overspend, which creates crisis management, which in itself is inefficient, <laughs> you know, way of handling things and so on. So, yeah, yeah that, that kind of thing. So, thank you. And I spoke too much. To, uh, I promise I'll stop. There is now. a valuable comment, Councillor, but in terms of time, and I, and I think that if you can wrap up on this question, that will be helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, ju I just really to support, I think they're all valid points and absolutely that's all All of the, the comments that you've made are built into our approach, our financial planning approach going forward to try and get us to start the year with the right budget that we, we think is achievable and realistic, that we've estimated all those pressures. But yeah, all valid points. Thank you, Chair. So, thank you if there's no further questions, but I'd just like to just emphasise a few points. So, Thank you for you know uh, being in Haringey. So we had a we had a meeting beforehand. So I think it was your first two weeks, and I, I find that meeting really really helpful. So thanks so much for that. But you know, I think you have clear plans going ahead, uh, and you know the pressures and the challenges, which we, which we have talked about in that meeting. Thank you so much. We can now. Um, Agree the recommendation. So the, the recommendation is that the committee notes the content of this report and the addendum draft statement of the counts. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will move on to the next item, which is item 10. The draft annual governance statement 2023. Can I now invite the officers to introduce the report? Minesh Jani? Is it Vanessa? Sorry, that's what it says. Vanessa, could you please introduce your report? Thank you, Chair. I'm Vanessa Bateman, Deputy Head of Audit and Risk Management. So the annual governance statement it starts on page 235 of your agenda, represents the outcome of a review of our governance arrangements that occurs between February and May each year, uh, with monitoring during other months of the year to ensure we fully comply with the expectations placed on us. It's part of the statement of accounts, so it's an outward facing document designed to try to provide assurance to our stakeholders in the borough. Pages one to four, so 235 to 238 of the agenda, outline the purpose and the key elements of our governance framework, as well as specific events that have been uh, significant in the year. Pages five to 23, so 239 to 257, as it's quite a long section, contains our comments against all the principles of good governance as outlined in, in the framework. And these are reviewed and updated uh, by key responsible officers across the organisation to ensure that the comments included remain current. Uh, we highlight in the right hand side of that section any of the, of the actions identified as we complete the review. Page 24 to 32, so 258 to 266, contains six significant governance issues identified as part of last year's process. The, the issue owners have updated the progress um, with completing their action plans as at the end of March. Um, and we highlight in that section our intention to retain the issue or close it. Members will recall we did an in-year update, I think at December time, it came to this committee um, and senior leaders have also presented in other meetings regarding some of these issues. <laughs> While the activity to review and refresh occurs, we also commence conversations with senior leaders, particularly those with statutory responsibilities. The directors work with their management teams and each director signs off a governance declaration statement. 
our statutory office groups meet some workshops issues as well as reviewing the end of year position for last year's issues page 33 to 36 so 267 to 270 contains six issues that we're uh, including for 2023 to 24 for us to monitor in this financial year these are our significant governance issues for the financial year the first four in the table so relating to finance asset management housing and information governance are all areas that have carried forward from last year with there's been some wording updates they've been refreshed slightly but those are four areas that we're carrying forward with two new areas have gone on as a result of this year's review those relate to workforce planning uh, and procurement. Page 37 to 39 contains specific comments from statutory officers regarding this process. And then the document concludes with sign off from the chief exec and the leader. The process ran smoothly this year. Engagement was really robust. A full range of governance and risk conversations have occurred as, as a result of this review. And although not everything ends up in the final document, all of that will feed into the risk management framework and the audit plan. As we did last year, we'll monitor in year and provide an update on the actions in the statement for you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vanessa. Is there any questions? No. I'll just give like a couple of more seconds just in case if you members have any questions. Does it all good look good? Yeah. No? OK. Read out the recommendation then. Uh, so the recommendation for the draft annual government statement report is for the committee to review and approve the draft 2003 to 2004 attached on Appendix A and that the audit committee notes approval time scale and processes of for the draft 2003-2004 AGS which is the annual governance statement okay thank you so much Vanessa so I'll move on to the next item which is item number 11 the annual internal audit report 23-24 uh, <laughs> I hope that wasn't my voice <laughs> if that's if, if you can help that will be helpful so can i now invite uh, officers to introduce the report well you you decide is it is it you or is it vanessa <laughs> thanks so much could you please introduce your report thank you chair um my name is minesh jani i'm the head of audit and risk management for for new members um and as part of my role, I'm required to bring to you a summary of the work that we've carried out in internal audit for the last year. This is stipulated in the international standards for people who do internal audit work and particularly the, the heads of audits. Um, and that's summarised for local authorities in a document called the Public Sector Internal Audit Standards. Uh, so this is actually a, a, a must for me. Um, and as part of that, I also have to highlight to you a number of key key matters uh, of relevance. And so what I'll do is I'll talk you through the document and in particular identify the, the key areas. So the first area is around the audit plan um, and what we ended up delivering in terms of the work for last year. The second area is around the outcome of the work. So having done the audits, what did we find? Uh, the third area is my my view, my opinion, on what do I think about the internal control environment of the authority as a whole? And that's predicated on the work that I've done, but also any other information or intelligence that I've picked up from other sources, um, such as external auditors or uh, other assurance bodies like Ofsted and, 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 and others. Uh, I'll, I'll then give my view of what I think the audit work tells us. What, what is 
What is the work that we've done last year? Tell us about the internal control environment in the authority. Um, I'll also speak about the audits that were completed in the last quarter, just so you're aware of what was completed as part of the quarter four yeah. work separately. And finally, I'll talk about a document called the Quality Assurance Improvement Plan. That is, again, something that I'm required to maintain. Um, and I'll speak to what I think are the key key issues that I need to include. So there's a there's a few few things, and and you'll see the report has a number of appendices that capture capture all this. So starting with the first first area, um, in terms of the the work audit, um, as we've discussed already, the internal audit work is delivered predominantly through the work of Mazars because we've outsourced our external audit. Sorry, our internal work externally. Um, but actually, between myself and Vanessa, we play quite an important role in making sure that um, Mazars focus in on the key areas of risk and think about the scope of audits so that we can get the best value from the work that they do. Uh, I think that's quite an important facet because being external sometimes has its advantages, but sometimes you can't always appreciate the risks that, that may lie within systems. Uh, the approach that we have is essentially one where we do a risk assessment, we seek to ensure compliance, um, we're looking for operational efficiency in our systems and good financial controls, and we want to raise recommendations with a um, sort of a view on process improvement. So the idea is that we want to try to get to an internal control environment which provides a sound basis for carrying out our operations. Um, organizationally, that's referred to as getting the basics right. But essentially that's that's where we are we are trying trying to get. Um, in terms of the overall opinion, you'll see that I have considered all the audit work and assigned an adequate level of assurance. Um, in terms of the work that we actually did, about 50% of the audits received a good level of assurance. And by good, I mean uh, substantial assurance or adequate assurance. And about 50% received inadequate level of assurance. By that, I mean limited or nil. Um, the work that we do is biased in the sense that we're looking at areas of high risk, and I encourage all the directors and the organization to raise with me concerns they may have in their operations, which I'm glad to say that, that they do, um, which tends to push me towards areas where we know there are some, some difficulties. Um, so I come to you usually with a lot of audit reports, with a number of recommendations and a number of areas where the level of assurance isn't great, um, but taking into account the fact that actually overarching that is a is a good level of governance, um, and we spoke about that in the previous paper. Um, I feel adequate is is the right level of assurance to to, to give. Uh, thinking about where a lot of the audit work is done and where a lot of our recommendations are raised, um, predominantly they sit around broadly three areas, um, contracts and procurement, and we've spoken about that uh, this evening. Um, I've raised um, some concerns around commercial property um, within property services. Um, property services has been audited quite significantly over the last two or three years. Um, some areas, particularly around the acquisitions and disposal process, um, have shown an improvement where I think I brought a paper about six months ago to show um, a good level of assurance there. But there are some areas, particularly around commercial property, where that improvement has yet to be uh, achieved. Um, so that there's that area. And finally, um, around the audits we do in, in the housing area, um, we do quite a few audits, uh, typically between seven to 10 audits a year on different aspects of housing operations. Um, and a lot of those in recent times have received a low level of assurance. Um, so that's another area where I think a lot of our limited assurances 
and our recommendations are, are raised. I've also this year tried to look at the audits that we've done from a slightly different lens, and that's to try to understand what are the types of issues and recommendations that we are raising, not from a service point of view, but the actual nature of the recommendations themselves. What are they? And in the report, you'll see that I've captured that in essentially five five areas. Um, so the type the types of recommendations and the the, the risk areas that we, we identify tend to be around management controls or the lack of management controls, um, record keeping, um, where particularly around decision making, the records are not always as thorough as they should be to record a decision uh, that, that has been made. Uh, the use of management information. So this is about using uh, performance management systems of some type to inform management of how effective their policies and practices are in delivering what, whatever they're trying to, to do. Uh, we sometimes find that policies and procedures are not as up to date as they should be. Um, so where people are carrying out their roles, actually the direction that they've been given isn't necessarily as up to date as they should be. Um, and finally, this is a more a generic point. Um, in, in the world of audit, we think about um, uh, processes, systems in, in broadly two ways. Um, the first is that we ask management to carry out a lot of tasks for us, but they are supported by what we call the second line of defense, uh, support services essentially, who are there to help direct um, operational activities so that they're compliant with council standards, but also then support and ensure compliance. And, and I've, I've noted that in a number of audit areas, that second line of defense isn't perhaps as strong as it should be. So what that means is that where functional areas are not necessarily getting their processes right, what should be, what should be a flag to us isn't always raised, and therefore the issue becomes a little bit more embedded than it perhaps ought to be. Uh, so that that's sort of an analysis, if you like, from a from a, the types of controls. Uh, you see that I've I've tried to analyze on page two eighty five. Um, audit work that we've done uh, in terms of schools as well as council work, and I've tried to reconcile what we've done in last year with previous years, just so that there is a comparator essentially to what, what, what we found. Uh, for last year, we kicked off with 58 audit projects and we completed 55 in the end. And, and in the papers, there is a quite a long list of or a table which shows all the changes that were made to the original plan and where we ended up with the final, final output. Uh, that is completely to be expected. Um, the risks don't stand still. The risks are always changing. And my plan is always flexing to reflect that risks change. And so last year and the year before that, I did exactly the same, where I presented a table with, with a number of changes. And I suspect it will happen this year as well. Um, Talking about the the work that was finalised in quarter four, um, you see that I've issued um, a nil assurance report on the dynamic purchasing system. This is um, a, one of the procurement modules we have for uh, securing social care type arrangements for for people who need support. Um, and essentially, what the audit highlighted was that that module was not being used consistently between uh, children's and adult services. Um, so th that, that, that was the, the, key, the key finding there. There were a further 11 audits which were assigned limited assurance, and I've attached details of those on pages 297 and 298. Just to finish off on the final point, um, I spoke about the need for me to maintain my own continuous improvement plan, and that is required of my standards. Um, in looking at the work that we've done, one, one of the things I think I need to strengthen the internal audit role on is looking at follow-ups. Um, within the report, I've identified that there were a number of areas where we've followed up the audits. 
Um, but actually, looking looking at the summary, there are some that go back two or three years, and I'm not sure how relevant those recommendations are now in light of the, t the passage of time. So there is a need to refresh those and maintain them if we need to, or amalgamate them with the fresh audits that have been carried out more recently. Um, that's the first part. And the second part is um, there is, I think, a, a, a need to create some form of a, a system which doesn't really exist per se in how management can refer to all the recommendations that I've raised on one singular system. Um, so at, at the moment, what tends to happen is that I'll issue my report to the directors and the service who will be responsible for implementing the recommendations, but there is no easy tool by which they can monitor how they are doing unless they maintain a spreadsheet of their own. So there is something about how we can develop a, a product or some system that can be used council-wide to help managers understand where they are, and I think that will help implementation of recommendations as well. Because if truth be told, I'm not entirely happy with how quickly the recommendations are getting implemented. So there is something I think I can help the services um, with useful management information, which I mentioned earlier, uh, to be able to understand what recommendations need to be implemented by when. I have to say, though, just having said that, there are some recommendations which are really long tailed. And by that, I mean the nature of the recommendations I raise can't necessarily be uh, implemented quickly um, just because of the nature of the, the recommendation. So procurement really falls in that category where we are talking about a complete redesign of procurement services rather than a, a process or a system that just needs changing. Um, in those circumstances, I would expect there to be a, a reasonable passage of time for the recommendation to be implemented. But I think what's, what, what's really important is that there is some clarity on that. So what I'm also proposing as part of that improvement plan is that when I bring my quarterly reports to you, I will include within that uh, a, a section that just covers the follow-up status of recommendations on each quarterly cycle. So there is more visibility of, of that to the committee as well. Right, I'll pause there and take any, any questions. Thank you, Manish. Any questions? So. Just one second. So I got Councillor Mabub and then Isidore and then Mason. Yeah. There we go. Um, just two questions from me. So firstly, um, it's really good to see that community engagement have um, wanted to yeah, self-assess themselves, but um, I just saw on page 303 that nothing's listed for them. Is that because it's upcoming or? Yeah, of the, the Mazar um, internal audit. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Mabub, so, so the, the summary that you refer to, the, the final page of um, the work that Mazars did, what, what that is, is information about the status of all the audits. Um, so, the table you see there is essentially, um, uh, a, if you like, a for each of the audits, what was what was found? Is that what you mean? Yeah, it, it seems I'm unclear if nothing was found or if it's still ongoing. I, th I think it's not really clear from that. Sorry. Yes, I, yes. Um, uh, thank you for asking that question because I did skip over this. Uh, in addition to the audits that we do, which are the compliance types audits, there are some audits, not many, because that's not really the, the focus of the audit work, there are some audits that we class as consultancy. And in those, in those specific areas, the work that the auditors do tends to be more to inform what the service is trying to do. So in, in the regard of recommendations for community engagements, we had an audit on the plan to carry out a review of how effective we are in engaging with the community. Um, but when we spoke to the service, the service was of the view that actually, if we could use Mazar's expertise as being auditors elsewhere, and if they could share some of the things that they've done in that space elsewhere, we could use that to inform what we are trying to do here, rather than just audit a system that we know is being developed, is not as, as strong as it should be. So that, that's what was done, and therefore the recommendations, we didn't raise any recommendations, it was more suggestions for the service to take, take that up. Sorry. 
it'll, it'll be good to um just just for councils because uh, obviously we, we we're really pushing community engagement i think this year you know the the team's done great work but it'd be good to see what the recommendations are um if if are possible to share um, i mean it's probably not for this group but um to be shared um yeah after it's fine um just on my second question just on the on the fraud part of stuff um just on 15.10 um obviously i haven't been a part of this group for uh sorry page 372 um obviously i haven't been a part of this group for a year so um it, it might be something you guys have seen quite a lot that it's um it's new to me that the kind of kind of gas safety um aspect of it is that a new risk that's that's coming up or is it is that the next item? Have I yeah, skipped? Yeah, different. I thought it was together. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> my apologies. I was too keen. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, Councillor. At least Vanessa will will have a question as well, which we did. By the question, Lee. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I said I'll shut up, but I couldn't resist it. I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> uh, first of all, I've got to start by um, pointing out that it's a very well written report. I find it very easy to follow and also giving me the issues, clear advice or information on the issues that I need to know as a councillor. So thank you for that one. It needs to be put on record. I do note that we got a high level relatively with all benchmarking that we can think and everything like this high levels of low uh, ratings etc find the helpful paragraph 317 in particular summarizing the particular areas of the castle and from my memory this have been for a number of years now the same ones there and there so that is as well useful and i do think that it is a lesson for us to focus even more and say it's about time that we turn this, these areas around uh, there is also a, a problem about not responding to uh, recommendations by it's quite high level it's not as high as it used to be i mean as we remember a few years back is improved quite a lot but still it is important sometimes the logical is not very safe as in some of the areas it's exactly the areas that have the biggest problems as well, the ones that we listed before so i do think that we need really to make sure that that People don't get away. You can't say now it's three years past, therefore we probably have to see whether we write it off. You know, no, it should have been it should have been done. And uh, the that leads me to two very quick points. The one is about the selection of the subjects. I do appreciate that it is an instrument for managers where they have problems asking us to come and, and do that. But there is also a wider purpose, which is the wider assurance, especially for councillors that things are okay. And uh, is, I'm not sure whether we're still getting the balance right. You know, I mean, as in the past, we did really said that we asked the councillors as well where to pick up something. But I can link to that is a worrying comment that you make there, but it might not be as it is on page 295. Yeah, page 295 about resources that we are using less than other comparable authorities' resources. I don't know what it means exactly, but I'll be grateful if you could explain it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dyke. It is. Um... I, I totally agree with your the first point about implementing recommendations. Um, we ask Mazars for their expertise. Um, Vanessa and myself contribute to the audit process, and then management also put time and effort into allowing us to look at their systems and contributing to how how we can improve that dialogue that happens between auditors and management as to what we can do to to make things better. Um, all of that is lost if we then don't implement recommendations. Um, so I totally agree, and and that's hence my my comments about focusing a little bit more on that for for future. Um, in terms of the the balance, you, you're you're quite right, councillor. Um, I think the number of recommendations not implemented has come down, um, but I I, I I still want to just reflect on some of the older recommendations and make sure I'm not chasing my tail for no reason here. I want to 
if, if the recommendation is valid, and I think there are some older recommendations which are valid, um, they will remain on the register. But if, if things have moved on or if they can be combined with other recommendations, we'll, we'll take that up. Um, and the final point was about resources. Um, so yes, where we've done benchmarking of the level of audit resource we have in Haringey compared to the level of audit resource in other London boroughs, um, we are not the lowest. There are some who have minuscule amounts of audit days, um, but we are not the highest. I would say we are probably in in that band just below just below average. Just to put some context, our audit plan tends to be about 820 days or thereabouts. Um, other London boroughs probably range from 900 to 950-ish, and the lower lower number of days can go to about 500. Um, I'm not overly worried if I'm if I'm honest. Um, uh, I'll never say no to more resources. Um, obviously, that's just the, the nature of the beast. Um, but I'm not at a point where I overly worry about the the assurances I, I'm able to bring to you as the audit committee, and for me to fulfil my statutory well, not my story, sorry, my professional duty in being your head of audit and providing the level of assurance I think you need from me around the coverage, which I think is the, the point you raised, um, the coverage of audit in, in the authority. Uh, I have I have tended to focus quite a lot on areas where we know things need to get better, and they are the areas of risk. So risk is driving my, my audit world. Um, and I, I think it's probably right that that is the, the approach that, that I take. And um, so you'll, you'll see a lot of audits where the risk is relatively high and um, but maybe not so though not those areas where the risk is a bit lower councillor mason thank you and thanks a lot for the report really interesting reading the um a couple of things one is i was following up on the implementation issue um but looking at clearly some areas have got a longer time scale for implementation and that's divided into milestones if you like um for and then um there are the internal controls which enable us to know that the milestones have been met in the journey so what I wanted to check with you is where there are internal control weaknesses that you've identified, how can they be strengthened so that we can be assured at this meeting that those milestones are being met and we're going in a forward trajectory? Because I think that I've got several worries about things that seem to go backwards fairly often, you know, like the um, voids so frustrating you've got a three bedroomed house that's been empty for a year fit for rental and it's not rented out and you've got families squeezed into one room as counsellors that's our living nightmare you know and yet that's happening how do we prevent it from happening so that's the having those internal control weaknesses those in place so we absolutely know that that has to be addressed I think that's that's the uh, sixty-four million dollar question. Um, how how can auditors work in a way where their recommendations are implemented so that risks are completely managed even after they've left? Um, that that's that's the crux of that's the crux of it. What we've done is that we've got arrangements whereby we report on the the follow-ups that we do. Um, like I say, I think there is more we can we can do in that space. Um, there is a mechanism for me to report the status of recommendations to the statutory officers group. So that's a, essentially the chief, the director of finance, and the, the head of legal. Um, and I have previously reported sort of my frustration where recommendations don't don't get implemented quickly enough. Um, but the one thing I would say is that an audit is a, a point in time reference. So when an audit gets completed, um, we can give a certain level of assurance at that time with a view that we want to improve those systems. But as you quite rightly say, sometimes things can go backwards, especially if there is a, some some factor, a change in personnel usually, um, which could undermine the control environment. Uh, funding is, is the other thing that 
can that can be an issue as well. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm saying, Councillor Mason, is that uh, you're quite right. Um, there are areas where we know there are control issues, but they're probably not linked to the follow-up work. They're more linked to some other, particularly I'm, I'm, I am thinking voids, where there are some fundamental issues around how we get on top of the void, void management um, so that we can actually improve the, the letting of those properties. Um, Follow-up will help uh, because we have done an audit on, on voids and they help to crystallise the specific issues, but I think there are more some, some more generic issues there as well. That I was identifying um, was the internal control weaknesses. You, the reason why we've got voids sitting there for weeks and months is because of internal control weaknesses. And so ensuring that those, I mean, you you do identify those and very well but if nothing is done around the internal controls then we continue to have voids and people continue to be homeless and we continue to spend money on temporary accommodation absolutely right so so actually just just on on that specific point in general for housing i've been liaising with the 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 director for housing um and he came to our meeting uh, i think the last last meeting um, with a view to doing less audit work this year, more follow-up work on the recommendations that have already been raised, because I agree with his point, which is that, Minesh, you've told me where the issues are. I need a little bit of time to fix some of these issues. And I, and I have sympathy with that. But only so far, though, I have to be honest, I can only give them a small window. Just very quickly, that links back to this time scale for implementation and where the milestones are. Thank you. Byron, you want to come in? Yeah, just, just very briefly. I think um, my point, I think monitoring of the outstanding recommendations and the actions is going to be so important going forward. So I think as well as Manish, you know, I've been talking as well as reporting to the statutory officers group that uh, Manesh has just mentioned, really strengthening further that internal reporting. So, you know, actually it's director's responsibility to be accountable for ensuring that those recommendations are picked up and the timescales and, and the, uh, the, the kind of key milestones. And I think there is something that we might want to do in just strengthening the internal reporting of that. So particularly at an officer level, so not just a statutory officers group, but our corporate leadership team, so that we have got collectively as a group of directors an eye on those recommendations. Because I think, you know, any recommendation is only as good as what is its implementation. So that's just something that we're looking to further strengthen. So uh, we'll be putting that in place. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Reyes, you're next. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think, Minesh, uh, and it touches upon all the points that have been, been raised already, and I was wondering if we can kind of close the loop of your work, because I think everybody at this committee is aware of the corporate register that, that we have for the Council. So the, the, the level of work that you do and, and the conclusions that you come to uh, move the dial on, on that corporate register. Either uh, it shows a increase in the residual risk or a decrease in the residual risk. And I think to help monitor outstanding actions, uh, the committee, I would think, needs to understand what it means for those actions to be outstanding in terms of how it impacts the residual risk. So is there a way that your reporting can con can incorporate the impact to the corporate risk register by either having good actions in place and, and the outstanding actions? Thank you. Thank you, Vyas. That's that's a that's a really good suggestion. So I think in my quarterly update to you, in addition to identifying the recommendations not implemented, I think we can add a column or some some text around the risk that that poses. Uh, and that hopefully addresses that dial uh, in identifying the potential risk um, of not implementing the recommendation. Yeah. And I, I could actually probably do that for the statutory officers as well as CLT as well. Thank you. Just one second. As it, yeah. Rina. Hi. Th thank you very much, uh, Minesh. Uh, 
a really good insightful report Percy so so thank you for providing that a couple of questions and I guess it touches on the point that Rea has mentioned because some of those recommendations that haven't been implemented have been classified as priority one two or three and it would be useful to translate what that actually means for the committee so if I could ask for that the other point that or question that I had is to what extent do the findings and recommendations for one area kind of align with other areas to the extent that best practice across the council is shared so when you were outlining some of the themes of the recommendations whether it was um sort of management information or management control these feel reasonably i say generic in the context of the council and so wondering to what extent expertise is leveraged from an area that is doing very well in this space to those that are only offering limited or even nil assurance second point and then finally if i might ask one thing that kind of really struck me under 3.16 6 sorry was the high levels of foi and subject access requests that are not completed and given this is sort of bread and butter type stuff that i would expect what is being put in place to address that because i assume that's not going away what is the trajectory in that space thank you very much thank you Vina. that that's really really interesting points um so on the first which is really around the information um yeah i, I totally agree look i agree with you on that um i think it's actually linked to your to your second point which is around the, the the various priority of recommendations and how we can present that. If I could perhaps say to the next meeting, bring the P1 recommendations, which are outstanding, specifically rather than in the table that, that you see. Um, I think that would be a good starter for 10. And it will also give me a chance to refresh those recommendations. Um, so if I focus yeah. on P1s, uh, that, that, that'd be good. Right. Um, and, and on the point around FOIs and MEs, um, I, I I can't speak to it directly because I, I, that's more of a management function. Um, but I am aware that organisationally, the chief exec has been pushing very hard his directors to make sure that we respond to all the FOIs and in members' inquiries and subject access requests in a timely way. Um, it's clearly important, not just from a data protection act point of view. But actually, in terms of what we are as a local authority um, and being transparent and engaging with, with our community where they ask questions. And so I'm, I'm aware that there is a lot of effort being made. I mean, to that end, they, they have redoubled their efforts in terms of creating a, a, an application which is much more live and um, up to date with, with the inquiries we've had. Um, and is presented to all our DMTs. I mean, it comes to our DMT on a regular, regular basis to monitor and and manage them. But it's not got to a point where I think it's completely satisfactory. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Minish. So, Councillor Brennan. Uh, so, so I was just noticing that. Um, of the things that have not been implemented, we've got estate management is stands out seven things, and it rather sort of like links into um, Councillor Mason's point about the voids because the two things are together. I, like when I whenever I try to get mention voids in my um, you know my area, they always say, "Well, we're waiting. They're not repaired, so people can't move in, and they sit there for ages and ages." So the, that is something we really should flag. Is it going to be Ahmed? All right, thank you, Ahmed. So I just got uh, just a couple of points, if I may. Minister, first of all, thanks so much for this thorough report. Uh, it has occupied my weekend, so thank you so much. So there's one area that I want to draw your attention to, which is the leisure service that's coming in in house. So you may want to have a close eye on that because that will 
expose risks and governance and and um, uh, processes that needs to be looked into. Um, secondly, there is a so it's I don't know which page is on your page, but the cloud strategy. So. So the status is that the risk associated have been re-evaluated and the audit was not deemed to needed at this point. I think that's quite risky. So we need to have a date in terms of when that will be done because cloud cloud services is, you know, although you have some sort of control over it, but you don't necessarily have control over it because it could be based in somewhere in New York, it could be somewhere else where your controls might be bare minimum and that will undoubtedly expose a lot of risks to the to the, to the service and processes thank you chair um and, and thank you for your for your comments um quite right look so leisure services is, is on my radar um there is an audit in the plan which is just about to start to look at the implementation implementation route by which leisure services are coming back in-house. So this is not to review the leisure service function, but it's actually what is the program in place, a bit like the uh, the, the procurement piece we talked to earlier, for the implement or for the delivery of insourcing leisure functions. So with any luck, I can bring that to the committee in October uh, once the work is finalised. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you for that. And on cloud strategy, um, you're quite right. I think that the risks are high. And unfortunately, I think it was sort of the, the audit was clouded out or pushed out because of all the other audits that were on the plan. But I will reflect on your points and see if we can bring it back into the into the audit space for this year. Thanks so much. So I will conclude this item. So the recommendation it's for this item is that the audit committee notes the content of the head of audit and risk management's annual audit report and assurance statement of for 2023-24 and the accompanying appendices. Yep, agreed. Thank you so much. So I'll move on to the next item, which is item 12, anti-fraud and corruption quarter four progress report. Can I now invite Vanessa to introduce her report? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to start by saying this is a report members are familiar with seeing and then apologies <laughs> for new members it isn't. Um, this is really just a summary. I present quarterly reports to this committee. There's an appendix on Manesh's annual report as well that wraps up the whole year. But but this is just like a quarterly reflection on the work that the um, fraud investigators do within the team. It's a small in-house team, uh, six officers. Um, we, we work with a, a strategy and a risk assessment. And at the next meeting, we'll be bringing back a refreshed strategy because it hasn't been looked at since 2022. Um, we do update the risk assessment annually around fraud. Um, lo lots of things sort of happen and feed into that, and that tends to try and guide the work and the priorities we have. Um, page three, 370 of your pack, I suppose the sort of proactive work we've been doing this year won't be any surprise uh, around void properties and um, some work around temporary accommodation. Uh, we also had a sort of an increased risk since COVID around um, dual employment. So there's there's been work and, and that's sort of part of our national fraud initiative work. But, but and there's standard sort of matches around that. Um, the, the main work within the team, though, is uh, housing related. Um, we do uh, sort of the tenancy fraud. We do work around rights by just making sure there's no money laundering occurring within those tra transactions. So on page 371, we, I mean, we end the year. This is, I think, the first time since I've been here because I arrived literally just as, as COVID hit, um, where we've actually exceeded our sort of annual indicators. So through the work of the fraud team, we've tracked through um, 53 recoveries from that work, um, properties that we, we feel that our actions have, have driven 
that us to reclaim that property and that might be through some form of legal action it might just be through um, handing it back to housing with the evidence they need to um, to follow their processes also had uh, a number of rights buyers where our intervention has, has ensured those those rights buyers haven't gone through either with non-compliance with the actual regulations or where there is some sort of housing fraud present um, in terms of gas safety, um, the team uh, go out with the officers doing the gas safety executions, and that's because for a period of time that was deemed to be quite high fraud risk. So often the lack of engagement with the gas safety process was often due to something going on within the property or sometimes abandonment or sometimes there's other issues. So the team get involved there and um, often they provide support and some links between tenancy and social care around the circumstances within the property. Uh, during this year, though, we have done a project on Blue Bridge fraud, um, and that has taken a team member out for, for pretty much the whole year, but we're really pleased with the outcomes from that. There are increased sanctions. We're already seeing the deterrent factor is working, and we've got some meetings in a few weeks' time to talk to Parking about how, how we sort of drive that forward and evolve it. We think there'll be some prosecutions out of that, but that's not really the driving force for us. But, you know, it, It'll only be the sort of worst offenders. The driving force is just to try and deter the, the um, blue badge fraud within the borough. Um, we obviously have um, employee investigations we get involved with. We work really closely with HR to make sure that the right ones come into our team and the right ones go within sort of the management disciplinary space and some start with us and move that way and vice versa. So um, through the early in the year, we had a lot of activity in that space. I'm sort of it has helped the second part of the year. It's tailed off a little bit that and the whistleblowing reports, which has allowed us to focus on some of the other things that we do as a team. Um, and yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vanessa. So I got I got Councillor Mapple and then Councillor Diagidis and then I got Reyes and then Councillor Mason. Yeah, so thank you. That was an that was an excellent summary, actually. Um, so just just on fifteen point ten, the the because I'm, I'm I'm just struggling to understand. So is it that it's an increase because it's been investigated more rather than it's a it's an issue that's coming up more often? Is is it because it's being investigated, which is why the 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 case is arising? Is that is that what it is? Or no, I no, think no? it's literally just because we see it as a high higher risk, so the team go out to to make sure that they're going into the property. So. Um, what we had maybe maybe a while ago was a trend where the people aren't engaging with the process. They're not not in keen because they're not wanting anybody to go into the property for various reasons. So so yeah, a lot of the ones that are coming through, and a lot of these sixty though, are actually ones where um, the team are capturing that they are abandoned or even the person has died or even that they've moved into some sort of sheltered accommodation. So we stay involved in those to make sure that they stay on the radar and they're tracked through. So it's, is it an issue caused by the, the void problem that we've been speaking about um, all this time because it's because of, of abandonment really? Yeah, so yeah. there could be an element of that. There yeah. could be an element in the uh, tenancy management team um, have struggled to keep oversight of everything that's going on in the patches. So where they would be doing the visits, I think it's probably reasonably well understood that there's um, they've they're on a, they've got a backlog of those to do. Um, some teams are still sort of clearing backlogs from from COVID and things around checking in on tenants. But we definitely, I mean, our voids proactive project. Um, that really we did a piece of work and it was looking at the data that council tax held and pulling out information that housing didn't have. And that I think I think that's sort of another sort of 18 properties that came back in through doing that. So in some ways, what we're doing with our sort of intelligence and our data matching, or even just being prepared to put boots on the ground and go and have a bit of an extra look at what's going on, okay. we're bringing some of these through that if I think in longer term in the housing improvement plan in beds, we would hope that some of that moves back into business as usual. So I'd say that's sort of where the activity sort of stretching out. Brilliant. Thank you.
Thanks, Chair. Um, Vanessa, just two quick ones. Um, from the work that you do, do, do you find that some of the with its investigations or review work, are they indicative of uh, control breakdowns, or is it something that is just out of our control and only recovery and corrective measures can sort it out? Um, I would say quite a lot of the pure fraud work of the team is hindered by the control breakdowns within the organisation. So actually, we have cases where there is an element of fraud that we're past and we want to pursue. But actually, when we look at it holistically, there's actually control failures around that. So I wouldn't say that there's, we're, we're seeing huge amounts of extra sort of Broad within the process, there is there is a lot that is to do with sort of the, the the weaknesses in some of the systems and some of the things that fall through the gaps, um, and we often get it referred to us, and we look sort of across all the systems and across all the information, and we often come to what the root cause problem is, and obviously that's part of being the audit service is I'm linking that back to management to say this has come across as a fraud, and yes it. We understand why it rang alarm bells, but actually, if there's fraud here, it's nothing we're ever going to be able to pursue. Yeah. And this is what our sort of root cause analysis is. So, yeah. So I, I guess the second part of the question then is, is how uh, is the feedback managed by the by the relevant officials to make sure that there's action taken um, in in fixing those control breakdowns? Because then again, it links to the thing I asked Manesh around. The, the overall risk exposure? So I suppose really that's been through myself and Manesh and meeting with colleagues and talking to colleagues. One of the things that we're working on as part of strengthening the um, capturing of the audit recommendations is actually the fraud team has said, actually, we do raise quite a lot of recommendations as a team, but we do it in a different way maybe to the audit report. So one thing I'm exploring as part of that sort of change process is where we do highlight areas, um, maybe using that mechanism to capture them as well, so that they're very visible to lots of people. What they tend to be visible to maybe the relevant assistant director or head of service, where we think they that person needs to know. But actually, I think probably some of the things we're raising up and re-raising, we need to get that more holistic view of it. But that's, I think, how we're going to try to achieve that this year. Manesh, you want to come in? Just, just. Just, just to add to Vanessa's point, one of the things that we are acutely aware of is we have reasonable systems of internal control and fraudsters will always, always, always try to find a way of breaking that system. So we have to be balanced and mindful that there are people who have to come to us and present information to us to be able to get something from us as a potentially a property or a claim for something or the other, balancing what we need from them against the fraud risk that exists. And it's quite a difficult judgment, um, but we try to get that to a point where we don't inconvenience people who are genuinely in need of our service, but also deter fraudsters from being able to get through. Um, and that's where the Vanessa's team is so crucial in supporting practically the whole part, the whole the whole organization in referring matters to it where it thinks something isn't quite right. And it's always so just keeping abreast of what's changing constantly. Thank you, Manesh. Okay. Yep. Councillor Mason. Thank you. Um, I just want to address the issue of enforcement, which you were talking about here, really, um, and how difficult that is. I recognise that we don't have enough resources to do this, but we end up um, as councillors um, looking at not necessarily the direct issues around fraud, but indirect issues. Um, for example, um, people who put up a hat of something in their garage at the back of their house and suddenly you've got people living there and then it's extended and extended and nothing happens, even if you report it. So issues like the improper use of accommodation for industry, light industry, like um, the use of oil in a, t uh, you know, in a tenement block is really dangerous but that's ongoing so all these things which increase the risk to residents which aren't necessarily controlled by the council but maybe like temporary accommodation planning licensing um, but where the enforcement is really weak 
because of resources, I'm imagining. And I don't know whether you capture that and whether we are able to capture that. But I think it's a huge problem for residents. That's, that's, a, that's a really good point. Um, so there is, there is an audit in this year's plan looking at how we as an authority enforce our regulatory powers in those sorts of situations. Um, and that's really with a view to establishing whether we've got the right control environment to, to take action where those things are not, not being pursued or whether there's actually monitoring arrangements to ensure compliance. Uh, one, one, as, as you spoke, Councillor, I, I, it, it made me think that just as we have fraud call, which is our tool for people to report any, any, any worries that they may have about frauds, um, I'm sure the authority has tools for reporting those concerns. And perhaps I, I could go back to the head of service in that area and see how how many calls, how many referrals we get and, and whether there is anything more we could do in that space in terms of public, publicising that. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Councillor Mason. So recommendation for this item is, is the audit committee is responsible for monitoring the effectiveness of the policies on anti-fraud and corruption of receiving assurance with regards to the council's internal control environment and mechanism for managing fraud risk. To facilitate this, progress reports are provided on a quarterly basis for review and consideration by the Audit Committee with regards to anti-fraud and corruption. Is that agreed? Thank you so much. Item 13, any new items of urgent business? Non-reported, Chair. Thank you. So our next meeting is on 8th of October. So I'd like to thank all the officers and the members for their uh, contribution and have a good evening everyone. Thank you. Thank you.